So I have with me Zero HP Lovecraft, um, and we're going to talk about uh, his new work, Gotcha Pull, as well as some of his previous uh, works and his writing. Um, all right, so first off, I want to just point out that like your your newest uh, work is fantastic. Um, just going to start off with some praise. Uh, well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, it's rare that sci-fi these days um, is actually um, actually explores like interesting topics. I feel like a lot of the stuff I've read has been very um, kind of formulaic. Um, so I appreciate your your take on things. Um, so, like, what brought about the choice of using male sex robots? <clears throat> uh, you know, there are a couple levels to that. On the one hand. I think it's sort of a microcosm of the whole work because one of the major themes of the story is about the masculine being subsumed into the feminine. Mm -hmm. And so uh, on one level, we can look at this, this sort of little vignette at the beginning as uh, setting the tone for the whole work because what we have is a male character the, the hero, the protagonist, who experiences some anxiety, what I guess might even be thought of as castration anxiety, mm -hmm. if you're into Lacanian or Freudian types of terms. But it's like, here's something more powerful, more masculine than you, than you ever could be. Uh, and all the women are going for that instead of you. And so that's, that's kind of the idea. Is like, people always think about sex bots as you know, being objects of male uh, sexuality, just like sex toys, sex toys for men. What if, what if women, but, but always available and always submissive and always just exactly like a porn idea, but no one really thinks, oh, well, what if sex bots, I could go horribly wrong. What if sex bots actually were for women? What if the way that women fear sort of sexual rivalry from, from woman shaped sex bots, what if men could feel and fear the sexual rivalry from from male shaped sex bots. What would those be like? It'd be horrible. Yeah, no, it definitely uh, gave uh, it gave me pause when I was reading it, um, which is cool. Which is a nice. Um, it kind of gave me a homage to like the. It felt like an homage to like a Frankenstein and other like bodily horror type of works. Um, were you inspired at all by like? Uh, like, you know, like Frankenstein or The Thing or things of that nature? Um, I did read Frankenstein once a long time ago, and I really enjoyed that book. I think, no, though, uh, I, I spend a lot of time on the internet, as you might imagine. <laughs> yeah. And I try to just read, I try to read the room, in a sense. And so something that I saw a couple years ago that was really becoming prominent is, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, sort of feminist hand wringing over sex bots, over the idea of sex bots. Like, are they really going to build women that just that just roll over? Are they really are men going to need women at all? And so I saw like this rash of articles come out for a minute there where people were talking about, well, sex bots shouldn't you should have to consent. Like you should have to get the consent of a sex bot. In fact, a sex bot should be able to say no to you sometimes because if it doesn't, then I guess that's that's somehow immoral uh, in in this feminist morality, and you can see like you can pretty clearly psychoanalyze that. But I thought about it, and I thought I, I saw another article where a woman said she she thought sex bots should be able to take control, and that was kind of the impetus for it. Is just like what what would a woman's perfect sex bot look like, you know? You know, for sure. Um, so you mentioned psychoanalysis, um, psychoanalysis quite, quite a bit. So are you, I take it you're a large fan of like Lacan and like Freud and of that nature? Um, um, not, not really, to be honest. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you great. can't help but notice them. Yeah, it's hard to take, like, it, those are, they're interesting ideas to play with at the very least. Um, cool. So another thing, like your prose um, is I don't know if like this is like an uh, insult to other people is like very well done considering it's also sci-fi. Um, like what, um, for those who are less familiar, what are some of your um, inspirations from, from a prose perspective? Ah, uh, yes. So I think 
If you actually read H.P. Lovecraft, it's written in this very anachronistic and sort of purple prose way. And he, that's, that's deliberate. He's trying to evoke a mood of something ancient. I am more comfortable with the modern and the postmodern. So one of my biggest influences, just in terms of sentence crafting, is David Foster Wallace. Mm -hmm. I also have tried to find something a little more mythological. And to do that, I read the King James Bible quite a bit. And I tried to incorporate elements of biblical prose, repetition, and, uh, you know, some of the sentence structures and some of the language that they use there was a big influence. That's so funny. Uh, well, it's funny because uh, a lot of my, there's a meme kind of going around in like my part of Twitter that's saying that's no one ever is that no one's actually finished Infinite Jest. And that's like one of the first things I noticed when I was reading uh, your work is that it has a, um, the like intertextual references are a lot like the footnotes in Infinite Jest, as well as like kind of like the whole idea of like amusing yourself, like, like, yeah, like pleasure kind of becoming, kind of taking the other, um, I don't know, like pleasure becoming like a negative thing and kind of becoming more demo- like a more demonic like death. Type. Yes, you're you're thinking of I mean like in Infinite Jest, there's the entertainment, which is the idea of this this TV program, this videotape that if you watch it, you'd rather watch it than eat or sleep or go to the bathroom. So everyone who watches it dies. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was also a big theme in my earlier work, God Shaped Hole. I'm very interested in the feedback loop between uh, digital media and entertainment and kind of like our addiction. So you could say that. Infinite Jest is still a big, a big influence on my work. Absolutely. That's great. And then I, yeah, definitely picked up a lot of like the Bible, um, I guess, sentence structures, um, the biblical sentence structures from your work. Um, so yeah, no, it definitely came across. Um, so just to the slightly shift, um, did you ever consider, or did you actively consider like that you were going to write a work that was like kind of on the cutting edge of like internet medium? Cause, because it's not very common. I don't actually think I've seen it before where a book is so in, like based on like hyperlinks and there's promoted like ads and stuff. Like, was this like a conscious choice or did it kind of just come about naturally? Uh, well, you know, it, it continues a lot of the themes in my previous work, the gig economy. In some ways you could call it, the same story, but told through a very different lens. I think there's a lot of commonality there. What I do is I just, I, I, uh, like I said, I spend a lot of time online. I spend a lot of time on Twitter and on social media sites. And I really just try to reflect back what I see. So it's not that I'm trying to do anything futuristic. I'm just trying to do something that feels authentic to where we are right now. Like, what, do, what, are, what are my personal experiences of being online, of interacting with people through social media? So a lot of time when you have a science fiction text and you describe something in the future, what you're really doing and what I'm doing, I think, is just making a comment about right now. And it's supposed to feel like, it's supposed to feel more current than mm-hmm. anything else. People say that like Brave New World, which you sort of evoked there, uh, it wasn't really Huxley writing about the future. And same with, same with Orwell, these two really famous like high school dystopias that people read. Both of them were intended, more than anything, to be satires of the current moment when they were written. You know, you, you cast things in the future as a way to better understand your own time. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, to that point then, like, um, what do you think of like, I mean, it's very obvious from the work, but just for like other people who are listening, uh, what is your kind of thoughts on like the modern, like, I don't know, like the ways in which the feminist movement has kind of like shifted the cultural landscape, um, like kind of like a lot of the sexual, um, permissiveness, et cetera. So I'm still working on developing, if you like a grand thesis on this topic and definitely the, the story that you've just read or that we're talking about here is an attempt to wrestle with these issues because it's uh it's something that you can look at and stare into this void and it will kind of hurt you 
and bend you and take as much of your mental energy as you want. And it's, at least for me, I feel quite powerless against it. There's so many things that I just want to say, stop, stop doing that. Should stop. We should stop. It shouldn't be this way. But it really is true in a sense that you can't turn back the clock. Yeah. And uh, if anything, this should be a really strong argument for why we don't just go randomly making progress, if mm -hmm. you like. Why we, why we should be more conservative in perhaps a Burkean sense. Because if you really can't turn back the clock, if every choice you make is, is permanent, is irreversible, then why would you just recklessly decide to tear things down? This, this to me seems like the height of hubris. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as like, as far as a definitive uh, answer to all of this, I would say this work is one more attempt at answer, but perhaps there can be no answer. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so uh, like you recently tweeted about like Hideo Kojima being like a uh, fairly, a very influential right-wing artist. Would you consider yourself also to be in that kind of same vein? I am... I mean, my influence is very tiny, let's be real. It's perhaps much bigger than it was two years ago, but it's still very, very small. And I uh, honestly, I don't even know if I want it to grow. I like the idea of maybe some smart and influential people reading me. I certainly hope that happens. But even if you consider a uh, Bronze Age pervert who has gotten a ton of media attention lately and you have like hit pieces written about him, this is very, very scary to me. I don't really want to be the center of that much attention, I say, as I do an interview on your podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I'm fortunate I'm in a particularly large podcast. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you also bring up, so, like, oh, the, the sentiment I'm getting is, like, a, a, you know, like a reactionary sentiment. Um, um, but also there's, like, a sense of, like, you can't stop progress which is gives me kind of like an accelerationism vibe what's your like what is your take on that thing on accelerationism more broadly oh uh, yes i two years ago i was very very excited by the idea of accelerationism and i think many people were because we were discovering that there were different different schools of thought who were all kind of converging on the idea of techno capital acceleration and that maybe you can't even stop it, that we're just going to have uh, more and more technological development faster and faster, and then like a god AI destroys the world. This is a fun thing to think about. It's fun as a, an eschatology, which is to say an end of the world sort of scenario. It's fun just to imagine, but it wouldn't really be fun if it happened. And one of the persistent themes of acceleration of most types is that this is horrible. You wish you could stop it, but you couldn't. So it's fundamentally a horror story. Mm -hmm. But as, as we've gone on and talked about this idea more and thought about it more, I think it's become very difficult to continue to believe that that's really going to happen. What we see is there are many decelerative forces and many accelerative forces sort of working in against each other. And it seems like quite a leap of faith for no reason at all to, to think that the acceleration is going to win. So, uh, you know, for the short term, we're still very much dependent on bio capital, which is to say smart people, smart people who have the resources and the even the inclination to pursue, you know, new technology and new sorts of new, if you like, reproductive modalities for capital. So I don't know that's necessarily happening. And sometimes I'm not even sure I want to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's kind of been a, a theme, well, I guess theme in like two episodes uh, about like acceleration and accelerationism being an interesting idea to play with, but it seems a lot like many like end of the world type of um, thoughts. It's, or like, yeah, you know, streams of thoughts. It ends up kind of being more like wishful or like, you know, like, I guess like an apocalyptic thinking and it rarely comes out. I personally, I, I go by the, um, 
I, I predict that like we can't, we've never predicted the end of the world and we probably won't predict what actually kills us because otherwise we, you know, avoid it. So while yeah, it's most likely true. Yeah. So while it's interesting, it's definitely um, not, uh, I'm not pre- convinced it'll happen either. But speaking of the end of the world, um, I'm just going to briefly like transition to your other recent work, uh, the Green New Deal, which uh, I, when I shared it with my roommate, he like like was actually like stressed out for a little bit reading it. Um, uh, could you talk about so for those who don't know, Green New Deal is about um, environment is like a is like a novella that covers topics of environmentalism um, and like kind of like the a possible route that happens there. Uh, can you speak to that work a bit? That was something I put together very quickly because, you know, uh, I think a lot of people for about three days a week, everyone was talking about this, uh, this girl, Greta Thur- Thurnberg. Somewhere. And uh, she goes on in front of all these people and she kind of talks in this old timey Hollywood accent. How dare you? <laughs> like, I mean, if you didn't think of an old movie from the, the 20s or 30s or something, she has a, a transatlantic accent. Mm-hmm. Could this possibly be more manufactured and more saturated? And it's, it's, there is probably, probably a real danger in terms of environmental collapse and pollution and so on. I think that that must be true on some level. But I also think that it is very difficult to know anything for real because the incentives around the scientists and around the politicians and around the companies that push these green initiatives very much align also with the consolidation and the expansion of their power. Mm -hmm. And there's an idea of a watermelon, perhaps you've heard of it, which is that uh, a watermelon is green on the outside and red on the inside. And this is an allusion to communist takeover. Now that's, yeah. that's right wing paranoia. It's, it's not at all the case that like, you know, Russian communism from, uh, from the cold war is like secretly wearing the guise of environmentalism. That's insane. That's stupid. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, environmentalism and environmental legislation is a tool of those in power. And of course they exaggerate and of course they lie. And like you were saying, when we talk about the end of the world, you can go back and watch a Ted talk from the early two thousands predicting that like by now, like in the current year now, uh, Los Angeles is going to be underwater and stupid shit like this. And all of this just gets swept away. Like, of, of, these people have been lying to us for decades about what's actually happening and and the dangers they talk about are real but they are not nearly as dangerous or as imminent as we constantly pretend them to be mm-hmm. so if you take all that if you take that hysteria and that that like at most fever pitched that kind of environmentalism which greta very much represents it ends with this idea that humans themselves probably are the problem and need to die so and there was even a news story about one kid i mean he was like a teenager who supposedly committed suicide after hearing all this all this hullabaloo from greta's talk like oh wow we really are just destroying the planet we better kill ourselves and the fact that someone actually could think that probably probably not a mentally healthy person mm-hmm. sure but that's always who's going to die who's going to kill themselves right is someone Someone who's insane and maybe just this pushes them over the edge. Maybe they see a news story and they see like a seal covered in oil or something and they go, oh, fuck, man, that's it. I don't know why that that's it. So this is just about capturing that fear. The work wasn't as popular because it was much, it was seen as much more political than my other stories. Oh, really? It wasn't as popular? Well, it was, it was, it's been longer. It was more popular so far than God-shaped hole, but definitely there was some pushback like, oh, this author is just, uh, you know, polemical or ideological and this isn't, like, is he saying, what's he saying we should do? Should we just not care about the environment? Well, no, but you should be skeptical about, for example, plastic straws. Are we really to believe that this is an important bottleneck for, for saving the planet? No, come on. Everyone knows what the real problem is and, uh, 
the real problem. Sorry, that's yeah, I'm being a bit I, Everyone knows that the major sources of pollution are industrialization in the developing world. Everyone knows this. Mm -hmm. But obviously, if a few San Franciscans switch to paper straws, that's going to make a difference. Yeah, exactly. Um, like you can now fly first class to Chennai uh, with a sustainable bamboo straw. Surely your carbon footprint is better, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's 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 silly, and it definitely is preying on the mentally ill, as as you as you can clearly see from any of these like extinction rebellion like dance scenes happening in the street, or you know. The but that's just an orgy, man. That's just that's just an excuse to go like, oh hey, uh, take off your sustainable, organically sourced bamboo clothes, <laughs> you know, and dance on each other. Exactly. Very cool. Um, yeah, and while we're on the topic of like previous works, I actually have to like make a a, a, a confession. When I read uh, the Giga Comedy for the first time, I genuinely I didn't know it was a uh, fiction, and I spent like a solid hour looking for like this like subreddit to find like little tasks to do, uh, which speaks oh, to yeah. how well done it was. So that was a happy accident. I actually never thought anyone would think it was real. <laughs> but it just it just so happens that there was a subreddit called day jobs i didn't even know that when i created the i mean i literally never even tried to go there i never thought that was real uh -huh. but the combination of like the fake screenshots and the sort of think piecey tone of the work uh yeah i had people messaging me like hey how do we get in here how do like <laughs> what's <laughs> tell me more about this and i was just like dude come on it's a story about like alien like computers infecting your mind with <laughs> with glossolalia <laughs> yeah well i mean yeah that speaks to just the quality of it because it genuinely felt real and like i got caught doing the same thing yeah yeah no that's that's awesome i'm i'm really glad that other people got to have that experience i sort of wish that i could you know uh kanye west said i will never get to go to a kanye west concert and it i really felt that <laughs> I <definitely> felt that. <laughs> um, well, since a lot of my uh, audience comes from like the Bitcoin blockchain space, um, there's like obviously the gig economy, but also in in uh, Gotcha Poll, there's the whole idea of like human certificates, and I and it brought my idea, brought my brain to bl blockchain and like verifying identities. Um, so, like, what are your thoughts on that in general? Like, just the blockchain space, crypto. What do you kind of? How do you see it? Um, is it, what would you see in that space? Oh, I I couldn't possibly make a prediction about that. Blockchain has gone from something very hip and cool to a very sad marketing buzzword that basically just means our database is cryptographically signed. Is it? Your chain is private. No one even knows. Like, it went from something that everyone had to have in their marketing to now maybe even a signal of anti-quality where like, I bet if a VC sees your pitch doc and it has the word blockchain in it, they're just like, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> stop, you're wrong. Now. That said, uh, perhaps, perhaps uh, Bitcoin will go to the moon tomorrow and we'll all be driving Lambos. It'd be great. But I, I have some cryptocurrency and maybe that will pan out for me. Maybe it won't. I am more excited about Urbit. I think that's really cool. And that's not strictly specific. Well, Urbit, sorry. Yeah, Urbit. Yeah, but... But that is something that's also going in the direction of decentralization, of personal ownership of identity. There's an idea that if you are using Facebook or Twitter or something, you don't own anything about what you're doing, any of your content, any of your identity, any of your, your stuff. So instead of that, Urbit says you're basically a surf, you're a digital surf, and you should be a digital landlord. And Urbit gives you kind of ownership of all of your personal works and data so if that catches on which I, I mean i want it to i'm not necessarily optimistic about anything that would be that would be more impressive and important to me than anything on the blockchain on no, that's definitely a cool idea. yeah i've been looking into it a lot more and i also recently just found out it was made by mentors mobile so or like initially so also pretty cool yes yes that is a case of living your personal philosophy yeah exactly um, so also just because it's November and given the topic of your, of your work, uh, what do you, do you like, are you familiar with like no, November and like, what do you think? Oh, of course. 
Oh yeah, yeah, right. So, what do you think about that phenomenon, and how do you feel about like the immediate and like vocal media backlash for something that seemingly is fairly you know innocuous? Um, yeah. Yeah. On on one level, the whole thing is ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous that that companies act so outraged about it. There's a whole media cycle, and it seems like like industry built around. Look what a bunch of kids on Twitter are into now and this is this is the probably the equivalent of like a satanic panic in you know around D in the 80s or something like oh look at these kids they're not jerking off holy shit they're they're literally in league with the devil like that's that's the tone of these works and it's silly to it's silly on both sides it's silly to take these these outraged hysterical uh, news articles seriously, and it's silly to take the people who are crowing about no, no November seriously. Also, should you probably watch less porn? Absolutely, I think that's true. Mm-hmm. I think porn is bad. I don't think it's the source of ultimate evil in the world. If you got rid of porn, we would still have a lot of other problems, worse problems. I do think that pornography makes a lot of men's lives individually worse, and in a way that they don't realize because it. it Obviously, there's like a short, cheap pleasure, and then that probably prevents you from from being more effective in your life in real ways. It drains your vitality, it drains your your energy, and I think women like can pick up on it too. Like I think if you're constantly watching pornography and then you go try to meet girls in like a social sphere, I think you're gonna fail because mm-hmm. literally you you just you wasted all of your energy, you wasted all your sexuality. Uh, you know, frivolously. And women want that. They want vitality. So if you don't have any, of course, they can they can notice that in ways that you just can't even pick up on. Mm-hmm. So on that level, like, should should people watch less porn? Yes, I think that's true. No porn, even. That would be great. Are the porn companies, uh, you know, ultimately evil and exploitative and terrible? Yes, that's probably all true. But at the same time, I think we do see an overcorrective force on on the right and on Twitter of people going, oh, well, this, like, they scapegoat and they make it like, this is the source of all our problems. No, man, the source of your problems, there's no, there's no clean, easy answer to the source of all your problems. Should you cut out porn? Yeah. Should you drink less alcohol? Yeah. Should you not smoke cigarettes? Probably. Um, all these things are vices. All these things are bad. But I think people should also have a little perspective on that. Now, mm-hmm. at the same time, the fact that it infuriates all of these left-wingers and these journalists is hilarious, and you yeah. should definitely advocate No Nut November and drive them crazy. And it's hard, it's hard to ignore the, the fact that they seem to really, really want you to watch porn and be a slave. So, mm-hmm. like, Libido is, is a very fruitful avenue for domination, um, you're letting someone else control you sexually, and people don't think of porn that way, but all porn is a form of, of BDSM in a sense, mm-hmm. right? Like there's someone somewhere in a remote room, you know, uh, changing money and ordering people around and doing all the things that it requires to make pornography, and then they're sending it out to you, and you're basically their sub. Is that, is that who you want to be? Like, I think... On that, on that alone, like most people should be able to find the strength to not consume it, right? But at the same time, like I said, this is not one answer. It's not like you stop jerking off and all of a sudden uh, you can levitate and your third eye opens and you fucking <laughs> all that type of shit, right? That's a joke. That's a joke for a reason. Yeah. All, all porn is cut porn, everybody. But um, oh, yes. actually, bring me back to like how I first found you. Which I think, which I believe was like in your threads on Twitter, your, um, I was reading one of your either threads on women or on like the kind of coming of age virtual sexuality in the West. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And for those who are unfamiliar, can you like shed some light on that? So I think the thread you're talking about, um, I was reading a lot of uh, Bataille at the time, uh, which I also used a lot in God Shaped Hole. And he talks about a distinction between the sacred and the profane. And it's really interesting because I shared his ideas with some Christians and they weren't super jazzed on them. 
obviously the tie was pretty anti-Christian. He thought that Christianity fundamentally misunderstood the nature of the sacred and the profane. And his model came from a bunch of old anthropological research, which is itself perhaps dubious. But he draws a line between the profane world he sees as the everyday world. The profane world is the world where you work. It's the world where you eat and sleep and the world where you socialize. But the, the sacred world in a lot of this older anthropological research, especially is based on the idea of feast days and, and you know, like you have an autumn harvest, you have a solstice festival. And during these times, the rules are suspended. Not all of them, but you know, there's many things that you wouldn't do in profane life that you would do in holy time, in sacred life. And so I thought about that a lot and I thought about how it relates to American coming of age. You know, in most cultures, uh, especially like a lot of older tribal cultures and so on, you have these rituals where a man has to do something usually painful, maybe secret, maybe humiliating. Uh, and it's like initiation into manhood. Whereas like you go in a boy and then you like plunge your arm into like an anthill full of like horrible biting fire ants and your hand swells up and it's very painful and so on. Maybe they cut you in some way. This is quite common uh, yeah. as part of the initiation. You endure pain uh, in secret and that's sacred. That's a mystery. And then afterwards you are, you are a man. But I thought in America, we actually kind of invert this ritual. Um, the initiation ritual is pleasurable and it's it's a form of rebellion like rebellion is, is sort of the key idea of the american coming of age ritual you think about all these like baby boomer movies and and the idea that in high school you're supposed to rebel or in college you're supposed to rebel what are you rebelling against well your parents mostly and christianity and and uh not even society anymore but at, at a time it was seen as like rebelling against society you're going to go have promiscuous sex and especially you know if they they have this vested interest in telling you homosexuality is somehow not accepted. Like people don't accept it. People don't allow it. That's bullshit in 2019. That's absolutely bullshit. If anything, heterosexuality is not accepted. But yeah. so especially like even just five years ago, there's it's this idea that oh, gay sex is somehow taboo. So one initiation into not really to manhood but into personhood was like pick a norm, pick a taboo. In this case, perhaps gay sex or something like that, and then violate it. And that becomes a kind of initiation ritual. So just, I noticed some parallels between the trajectory of an American youth and how promiscuity, and like I said, there's many movies and TV shows and books that all kind of outline this basic, this basic course for a woman maybe it's just like going to a party and getting drunk and doing things her father would never approve of. Mm -hmm. For a man, it's like, you're not really a man unless you can go to one of these places and seduce a woman and get her to sleep with you uh, you know, you, you, that's, that's the only thing we have that initiates you into adulthood is like, can you go out and get laid? Mm -hmm. And a lot of, so, so I was looking for parallels in that to other, other coming of age rituals and other initiation into manhood or womanhood. Yeah. If, assuming I'm talking about the thing you're, you mentioned. Oh no, yeah. You're definitely talking exactly about what I was mentioning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely the first time, your thoughts were like definitely the first time I heard it formulated that way, but also, um, and it's it's always really interesting how, um, I don't know, I, yeah, like the, when you mentioned the queer movement, queer movement is like, and like just generally doing something in public that, that like breaks the taboo, that was the major like flip for, switch for me, was, was like, yeah, it definitely um, has become that since in the more recent history and like you're not and like also there was a tweet i guess in that same thread about how you're not really an adult if you have not done that and we don't really consider like incels for example to be um valuable like a real threat because they've never actually achieved the coming of age ritual and so i'm paraphrasing. Right, yeah yeah no no but, but you're right and it's it's incels and it's really there's a whole bunch of men in or males i should say who sort of choose to, or perhaps who are unable to complete the ritual. So instead they kind of opt out. And in Japan, they call these uh, hikikomori or vegetarians. And they're people who just, they say, you know what? No, I've got my porn. I've got my little figurines. Uh, my mom brings me food <laughs> through my door and I'm just out. I'm just not going to do it. And actually, uh, so I, I mentioned, um, 
he just now tweeted that that Hideo Kojima quote. And if you read in that thread, he actually says something that I thought was very, very similar that I haven't really said before, that a lot of this queer movement is built around people who are afraid of an emotional connection. So in a way, whether you're, whether you're male or female, um, I think a gay relationship is probably much less emotionally scary than a straight one, right? Like when you, when you as a man meet a woman or vice versa, you are actually interacting with someone who's quite alien to you, who's quite other, who's, who's radically other, actually. And Baudrillard and Bataille both recognize this, that seduction is uh, about incommensurable opposites. It's about something, that, like a gulf that's actually unbridgeable. It, you can't really ever, ever quite get into and relate with and fully align yourself with the opposite sex and their incentives in their mind. You can, you can learn about them, you can empathize with them, you can cherish them, but they will always, there will always be that hint of irreconcilable otherness. Whereas in a queer relationship, this is not the case. If you, I mean, or if anyone, if anyone who is male enters into a sexual relationship with another male, there's actually nothing other about it at all. They basically know exactly what they're getting. So there's much less of an emotional challenge there. In fact, there's arguably no emotional challenge. Perhaps you've seen a subreddit dedicated to cataloging selfies of gay couples where they're basically dating someone who even looks exactly like them. One interpretation of this is that it's just a form of narcissism, but I think it's something else. And I think you see this in lesbian couples too. They're actually quite afraid of something about the other sex. Now there's, there's perhaps other ideologies and you can go, you can talk about perhaps biological causes and you can talk about, uh, you know, even, there are many probably facets to it, but I think you can deny that there is an element of just fear here, like fear of the other that, that pushes people into queer relationships. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's a, uh, there's a art, uh, study done about like, conservatism and um dating someone who was very similar to you in appearance um and i always like to make the joke that like the modern like feminists are like the old church ladies um so it's there is a level of like absolutely yeah there. and actually think about it who uh so one one important realization is that genetics a lot of you it determines personality it determines even little, little things, your mannerisms. I don't know about you, but if I look at my father and mother and the way they talk and the way they act, I make the same facial expressions. I laugh the same way. I have the same, you know, little mundane commonalities. You can never escape this. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at who those church ladies' daughters are, they're basically those same feminists, exactly. right? Like it's, it's literally like you had, you had these people who put hate sex and pretty much like hate honestly hate men and hate anyone having fun and hate laughter this is the idea of the church lady right a scold she's an unhappy bitter scold who likes to exercise petty authority and her daughter grew up and became the exact same person but with an orthodoxy of feminism instead of christianity a hundred percent um sorry what were you about to say oh no i didn't say anything oh, okay um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely the, uh, we kind of, the boomer kind of turned right into the millennial SAW overnight, uh, or like in one generation. Um, but that's all the questions I have. Um, is, so are you working on anything at the moment? Um, are there any other, uh, or anything you'd like to promote other than obviously your newest work? Uh, no, not really. I am still recharging from that last work it took quite a bit out of me to produce that and uh you know i'm still humbled all the time by how much more other people are able to produce and how intricate and interesting other people's works are so for me it's it's a very uh intense and taxing process to produce something like this i'm catching up on my reading i'm uh you know meeting with friends but i will come back to writing soon i just need to I need to get some rest in a way, mental rest, more than physical. Awesome. Uh, wait, by by, uh, just for curiosity, or are you? What are you reading at the moment? Oh, quite a few things. I have a backlog. I have uh, 
I've been reading some short fictions by Greg Egan and by uh, Peter Watts. I've also been reading a book on the history of masculinity in the Christian church mm-hmm. and uh, a book on, oh, I've been reading Harold Bloom. He was recently deceased mm-hmm. uh, about the Western canon. Fascinating work. I really enjoy, I enjoy his writings quite a bit. Uh, after that, we'll see. But it's really nice to just sort of read a book instead of writing one. I think you have to do both. I think he, you, you can't do either of those things in a vacuum, at least for me. Yeah, for sure. Well, I have to just say at the very least, um, I was a, cu- a year, a couple, a couple years ago, writing um, about a topic very similar to this, not about sex or what, but about like virtuality and dating and stuff. And I have to say, I'm humbled myself by reading like kind of the scope of this work. And if you're listening, I strongly recommend if you haven't already done so, check out Gotcha Poll on Medium or uh, your actual website. Um, thanks for taking the time to speak with me. Um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, it was a a lot of fun. Uh, You have a good rest of your Sunday.